page. Thank you, Siavash. And if you click on this link where it says introduction to our seminar, it will open up the slideshow and then you can right click on it and save as, and you can then save this to your computer and have it for yourself. But it's always gonna be on our website as well. So you really don't need to download it. It's always accessible directly through our website. Okay, and then, like I said, it's an HTML slideshow and you can use the arrow keys to advance slides as well. Um, you can also use the click, the mouse click, but what we're gonna recommend you do actually is we're gonna recommend that you hit the K button on your keyboard. And what that will do is that will disable mouse click advance. So in other words, when you click your mouse, it will no longer advance the slide. And what that will allow you to do is it'll allow you to copy the code directly from the slide and put it into R if you like, okay? And as I said, this is gonna be an interactive workshop. So go ahead and open R and R Studio, and then you can follow along. Okay, all right, so let me go ahead and start. Um, so the purpose of this seminar is to introduce the functionality of R with a focus on data analysis. So in this seminar, you're gonna learn how to interact with both R through R Studio and learn a bit of R coding, then learn some tools to import, clean, manage, and export data. We're gonna look at some simple data analysis functions and then we're going to look at two of R's graphical systems, uh, base R and ggplot. And then finally, we're going to look at R Markdown uh, so that you can learn how you can share some of your data analysis with uh, your colleagues. Okay. Now, whenever you see a green box like this, this is some instruction for you to learn R and put some code into R so you can practice. Okay. Okay. So, R as a programming language. R is a programming environment, excuse me, for a statistical computing and graphics. R serves as a data analysis and storage facility. It's designed to perform operations on vectors and matrices. And so the basic data structure in R is a vector, and it also works very easily on matrices as well. Um, it uses a well-developed but simple programming language. And this is one thing that distinguishes R from other statistical data analysis packages is that R really is a complete language. And so a lot of things that you can do easily in R are not so easy to do in other software. Because of the fact that R is a programming language, this allows for rapid development of new tools according to user demand. So the latest methods you'll often see in R first before any other language. And then these tools are usually then distributed as packages, which you as the user can then download to customize your R environment. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of R? Well, some of the advantages are, of course, that it's free. Uh, and so you don't ever have to pay for R. And because of the fact that R is free, uh, a lot of the people that work in R want to make a lot of the tools to help you learn R also free. So there is a large uh, array of online books to help you learn R. So a lot of these things in the slideshow are links that you can click on. Uh, I'm not gonna be clicking on all of them today. We don't have time, but when you go back to your own, <laughs> on your own, you can of course go look at these books. Uh, another thing that people love about R is its graphics. So a lot of the graphics that you see in publications are made in R. Uh, they're quite easy to make in R. I would say easier to make in R than in other software packages. So graphics is really one of R's strengths. Another really great thing about R is R Markdown. And uh, this is one of the main reasons I use R so much is because you can create these data analysis reports that are dynamically created. So, you know, you can create tables of data analysis results. And then let's say suddenly you wanna change the data set. You can just re-change the data set in the code and then recreate the document instantly, but with new results based on the new data set. Uh, because it is a true programming language, R makes it much easier to add functional functionality and flexibility as you need, especially compared to other data analysis software. I kind of talked about this before. Uh, and then many specialized packages are available in R to do data analysis that you won't be able to find in other packages. So the array of methods available in R is much larger than in other packages. But R does have a few disadvantages. If you've learned other statistical software, maybe like Stata or SPSS, 
you might find are a little more difficult to learn initially. And for a, a lot of us R users, one of the more annoying things about R is how often you have to update it. So R does update quite often. And when you do that, you do have to usually update all of your packages as well. And so that can be a little bit of a, a maintenance hassle, but in the end, most of us feel like it's worth it. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about R Studio. And some of you may have already worked in R by itself, but I would highly, highly recommend that you use R Studio, which is a graphical interface for R. Um, and in fact, it's more of a development environment or integrated development environment that features um, a console. There, so this is a console where you'll see the results. Then it has this script editor right here where you can type, but it also, the script editor has like a, syntax highlighting, and it has a lot of other nice features to make writing code really easy. Uh, it has special tools for plotting and viewing our objects. Uh, and then it has cheat sheets for our programming and tab completion for object naming and function arguments. Um, so it will help you to figure out what the coding is for functions when you work inside of RStudio. And we'll demonstrate all of this throughout the workshop. Okay, so let's start with the RStudio console. You can input and execute commands directly in the console. So if you look at our studio, the console is usually on the bottom left, but I'll get to that in just a second. Um, whenever you run a command, the output of that command will appear in the console. Okay? And one nice thing that I mentioned before is that our studio features tab code completion. And so if you kind of train yourself to get used to working with tab completion, you can really save yourself a lot of time typing. So let me demonstrate. Um, right now, if you have our studio open, I want you to go and into the console. So for me, it's on the bottom left, but if you've rearranged our studio, it might be somewhere else. But for me, it's on the bottom left right here. And I just want you to type out the letters R and O. Then what you'll see appear, and this is strictly in R studio, you won't see this if you're working in just R. You'll see that it suggests a completion, R norm for you, and it also brings up a little, little help window as well. So if you hit tab, it'll complete R and O to R norm for you. And then if I hit tab again, for instance, it'll bring up these arguments for R norm. And if I hit it again, for instance, it'll actually type out that argument. So you can kind of train yourself to use tab completion to write out code um, if you kind of know like the first few letters of a function, for instance. Um, it, that can be very useful. Okay, um, then what I want you to do is I want you to go inside of that R norm and then after this N equals, you can type 10, okay? And this is the output. So this is what we input. This is the random normal function. So this is the random number generator from the normal distribution. And what we've done here is we have randomly drawn 10 numbers from a normal distribution. But I just wanna demonstrate that this is the console. So this is where you'll always see the output of your code. Okay, next we have the R script editor. Um, most of the programs uh, that we write for data analysis is gonna consist of a long series of commands. And so you don't really wanna enter code line by line into the console. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna write a script. And the advantage is, the main advantage is that you can save this script and then load it later on so that you know exactly what you did and you can do it again later on, okay? And so in R, the script editor is by default on the top left. But if you don't have it open already, you can open it by going to file, then new file, and then R script. So it's just the first selection on each side. All right, so again, that's file, new file, R script right here, okay? Uh, that's only if you don't already have one open. And so the R script editor has a lot of nice features that make coding an R easier, uh, including things like tab completion like I've discussed before, okay? So the next thing I want you to do after you open up this script is I want you to write the code one plus two in the script editor, okay? Just write one plus two. Now you may, you may be wondering, how do I execute this line, right? 
There are many different ways to execute this. So we can use R as a calculator, for instance, just to add up these two numbers. Um, what I would recommend you do in order to execute this is that you put the cursor anywhere on this line and then you hit control enter. And that will run a single line of code and then advance you to the next line, okay? If you're on a Mac, that will be command enter. But if you're on a PC, it's control enter. Another way you can do that is you can highlight the whole line and hit control enter. Or if you want, you can also hit this run button over here. Okay, whichever way you wanna do it. What I don't recommend you do, which a lot of people who are new to R do, is to copy this from the script editor and paste it into the console. That is uh, just a little prone to error and takes too much time, I would say. So just learn, train yourself to learn how to use these shortcuts, all right? Control enter or command enter. What I, what I want you to do next is I want you to uh, type the code log on the next line. Okay, so type the word log, and then you'll see a list of functions in R that begin with the word, with the word log. And so for instance, if you forgot exactly the name of the log function, R Studio is trying to help you. And again, you can scroll down and you select one of these, or you can just hit tab for the first one. We're just gonna use the regular log function at the top. So you can either select it or hit tab. Okay. Then, let's see what. Okay, and then I want you to enter the number 10 inside of the log. Okay, and so what is this gonna do? This is gonna take the logarithm of the number 10. And by default, this is gonna be the natural log, but we will discuss the log function in a little more detail in a minute. Okay, so I already went over this. So in order to run a line, you're gonna hit control enter or command enter again, okay? And so now if, you, if, uh, if I start on the first line and hit command enter, it'll immediately advance to the next line and I can hit command enter again, right? So I can keep running this line by line and I can see what happens after I run each line. So this is often the way that I run my R code is line by line, just hitting command enter over and over. Okay. Now I want you also to practice saving your R script. So go to file and then hit save or save as, and then just call it whatever you want, maybe practice. .r. And usually R files, R code files have the .r extension, um, but that's convention. You can, you, know, you can use whatever you want, but it will recognize .r as code files. Okay. okay. From now on, Whenever I ask you to enter a command, I want you to put it into the script editor. All right, that is the script editor. Then I wanna talk about the environment pane in R Studio. So in R, everything that we create, like a data, um, a data set or just a vector of numbers is gonna be stored in an object. All right, and when you create an object, you're gonna see it appear in this environment. Now the code used to create an object is either this arrow symbol, which we uh, create by doing less than and then minus, or with the equals operator. They essentially do exactly the same thing, but for whatever, e for whatever reason, you're gonna see the arrow a lot more in other people's code than you see, then you'll see the equals. So for whatever reason, the arrow has become convention. Uh, and I, I still use the arrow myself. So we can create an object in our script editor, for instance, by typing X and then assigning it using this arrow. Again, it's less than and then a minus. And then I'll just assign it a number like five, okay? And so if I run that command with, for instance, command enter, or one of the many ways I showed you how to run a command, you'll see that now in the environment pane, which is on the top right, that is where you'll see this object that's been created. Okay. It tells you that right now it's, X is actually a vector. It's a vector of length one and its contents are the number five. So this is the first object we created uh, and now we see it. If ever you want to then just look at the contents of an object that you created, you just specify the name of the object by itself and run that by itself. So I just need to type X and run that by itself, it'll show me then what the contents of X are when I issue. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, let me stop. Are there any questions at this point? May want to uh, see if I can you maybe help me unmute? Yes, yes, just. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Go ahead and ask if you want to unmute. Hi, okay. uh, this is Aruna. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, when you say object, are you referring to variable? Is that what it means? Because I'm, uh, I'm a SAS user. I'm trying to convert the language here. Um, it can be a variable, but it can also be a data set of many variables, or it can be a single number. It's just uh, something that's storing some data in general is what we call an object. Okay. Okay. okay, so if 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 I if you say um, object as a data set, then okay, data one, that's fine. But if you want yeah. to refer to a particular variable in the data set, you would still call it as object. Yes, in some sense, it, it is an object within another object. Yes, but okay, yeah, how would we will discuss how to access variables inside of data sets later on? I promise. Okay, okay. and then <laughs> thank you. One okay. more question: the sure. the your. The be it's, it's better to use the uh, um, better to use the source. Uh, I'm sorry, the language. Hold on. Script editor. Yes, yeah. script editor instead of the console because you can save the script editor and make edits. Correct. That's the reason. That's Got exactly it. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna okay. go ahead and move on. One, if you have one, one more question. Okay. Sure. One more. How how I can clean the environment uh, when I need it. If you need to clean the environment, uh, you can use this code. I'll put it in chat for you. This will remove everything. I'm not gonna go over this today, but it's the remove command. And yeah, I put it in chat for you, okay? Okay, okay I'm gonna go ahead and move on. We, we have a tight schedule, so I don't wanna take too long. Um, okay, we're gonna keep going. Andy, one question that is, I think is important. Uh, yes. We're confused to how to run a command. Okay. So if it's in the script editor, you just put the cursor anywhere on the line and you can hit control enter. Or on a Mac, you can hit command enter. Or you can highlight the code and hit the run key here. All of those are acceptable ways of running a command. Hopefully one of those will work for you. Right. Oh yeah, so if you need more help, one of the great things about our studio is that it has a large selection of cheat sheets. And cheat sheets are these graphical sheets <laughs> that have lots of R code crammed into them um, so you can access it quickly. So in order to access it, go into our studio, go into the help menu, and then find where it says cheat sheets thirds of the way down. Here you'll see several cheat sheets. For instance, I'll open the RStudio ID cheat sheet. It will open as a PDF here. And for instance, then it'll give you a lot of guidance on how to use RStudio, like what do all the buttons do? Uh, and then, yeah, what, what's in the menus, for example, and then some keyboard shortcuts, all right? But as I showed you, there are a lot of these cheat sheets um, and there's even more than you than you think. If you go, for instance, here, cheat sheets, all the way down to browse cheat sheets. Like I said, the R community is very generous in making free stuff. So there are cheat sheets for all kinds of things like ggplot, dplyr, tidy. Like I said, a lot of cheat sheets here available. So go browse that sometime and find the cheat sheets that work for you. Okay. Okay. We're gonna move on now to our packages. So when you install on your, R on your computer, you're installing base R and a couple of packages that come with base R. But what makes R really powerful is the large array of packages that extend its functionality. And these are downloadable usually from this comprehensive R archive network or CRAN for short. Okay. Um, as we said, base R comes with several packages on its own that are used a lot uh, for data management, for analysis, and for graphics. But 
most of the time you're going to need to load other packages to do exactly what you want to do. Um, you know, this number 15,000 might be from last year, so it's probably grown quite a bit since then, but there are, are a lot of packages available for download at CRAN. And there are others that are available downloadable from like GitHub, for instance, as well. So there are tons of packages out there for you to use. Okay, so if you want to install a package, uh, you're going to use the install.packages function. And you just put the name of the package inside the quotes. And if the package has other packages that it needs to run, then we recommend you add the argument dependencies equals true, which will tell R to download all the other packages that this package depends on. Okay. And so for instance, here we're saying install the package dplyr and any other package that dplyr package depends on. Um, once you install it on your computer once, you don't ever have to do it again until you update R. All right, so this is install only puts it and downloads it onto your computer. It doesn't actually make it available to use right away. Though. It just downloads it onto your computer, okay? If at this point you haven't downloaded um, the three packages used for the workshop, please go ahead and download them now. Okay, now, as I said, when you install that package as the package, you're just downloading it. It's not usable just yet. In order to use it while you're using R, you have to load it into the R session. And we use the library function or the require function to do that. And all you do is you put the name of the package, this time without quotes, inside of, let's say, library. And then that loads all the functions and data structures in that package into your current R session so that you can use them now, OK? Um, so why don't we go ahead and load the dplyr R package into R now. Okay. If you've already installed it, you should get a message that looks maybe something like this, or you may get no message at all. If you library and it's already loaded, it won't give you any output at all, but that's fine. But as long as it doesn't say some kind of weird error, it probably worked. Okay. You can also do this directly through our studio. Uh, there's a package tab here, and you can click here to also to um, both install them and to load them through library. Okay, but I, I I'm going to teach you the coding way. Okay. All right. So library to load the package. Require is basically the same as library. Um, so you can use them pretty much interchangeably. They do they do return slightly different outputs though. Um, if you are interested in uh, looking at tutorials, sometimes the author of the package will write a nice long tutorial and store it as a vignette. Um, if you want to see all of the vignettes that are available, you just type out the word vignette and then open and close parentheses. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for you, but you don't have to do that if you don't want. Like this. All right, so if I issue that command, it'll bring up this window. And then each of these is a tutorial that I can load. And you know they're associated with the different packages that are uh, installed in R. So one of the, one of the vignettes that comes with uh, one of the packages we loaded is the dplyr vignette. Okay, so you can go ahead and load this dplyr vignette by typing vignette, and then in quotes dplyr. I Okay. Or again, if you want to just copy it directly from here instead, please do so. Okay. And then when I type that and, and run that command, it's going to open up the dplyr vignette here in R Studio, and this is a tutorial on how to use dplyr. Now, not every package comes with these. It's you, you know, usually the well-supported packages. It depends on how much effort the author wants to put into it. But if it's a very popular package, it'll often come with one or more vignettes. So those are really useful to help you learn how to use that package. Okay, okay. now we're going to move on to basic R coding. Okay, so we've already learned the first thing, which is how to assign data to an object, right? You're going to use the left arrow symbol, which is my, less than and minus, or you're going to use equals. Um, in R, and as in most other data analysis software, we have both numeric data, which are numbers, and we have character data, 
which is, you know, letters of the alphabet, for example, or strings, we call them. And if you have data that are strings or characters, you need to surround them with quotes, okay? So I can create an object named A, and I can assign it the string hello in R, just like I created this X, but instead I'm gonna put the word hello in quotes, right? So I'm gonna to go to my script editor, I'm gonna type A, I'm gonna assign it through the arrow, and then I'm gonna type out the word hello in okay? And this is a string variable. So now you can see in the environment, there is an A object, which is actually a character vector of length one, and it has the value hello. So whenever you're working with string variables, just remember, you, if you need to find a value or assign a value, you're going to need to use quotes. Don't forget. All right, so in R, in order to mark the end of a line, uh, you can use a semicolon or just use a new line. All right, so you don't have to end all of your statements with semicolons like you do in SAS, for instance. You can just start with a new line. Unlike some other software packages though, R is case sensitive. So you do need to pay attention, for instance, if some things are capitalized or not. So some functions will have capital letters in them and you need to pay attention as to where those capital letters are. Um, the hashtag or pound symbol marks the beginning of a comment and comments are not executed. Right, so you can put a hashtag and then write whatever you want afterwards, for instance, some notes to tell you what the next line is going to do. R will just ignore that line. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you on the next line, create an object that's named B, assign it the logarithm 10, but put the pound or hashtag symbol at the beginning of the line. And let's see what happens when we execute it. You can really type whatever you want, but put a hashtag and put then some code. So I said, just put B log 10 like that. It doesn't matter what you do. What I want you to do is that when you execute this line, for instance, when I hit control enter, nothing happens, right? It just advances and nothing comes out. All right. And this is what it is. Uh, that's what a comment does. It's just, you know, it's, it's a way for you to put notes like next line runs a regression. You know, I can put some annotation into my code to tell me what it's supposed to be doing, okay? Um, commands can span, span more than one line. So sometimes uh, if you need to put a command on more than one line, you can, for instance, put an operator like plus at the end. So R knows, for example, that this does not two plus, it's not a full command. It's looking for something else to finish that line. And I can put the end of that line on another line like this, for example, and that will be okay. So if I run this, if I hit, if I put the, the cursor on the line with the two and I hit command enter, R will keep going until the command is finished, right? And it knows that something has to come after plus. And so it finds this three and it says, okay, that's, that's enough for me to finish this. And so it runs two plus three. Okay, so sometimes, you know, you don't want your lines to get super, super long, so you may need to divide them up. You can use things like plus or comma at the end of the line to continue on to the next line. But what you don't want to do is put a, the plus here because it'll run the line two by itself, right? So if you want to connect lines with the plus, put the plus at the end of the line or any other symbol, okay, like that. All right. All right, functions. You know what, let me, let me pause there for questions really fast. Does anybody have a question? Let's see if I can. Any questions? What is a string? A string is just a, a character, a set of characters, like the word hello. We, we, contrast strings with numeric data, like one, two, three, four. So it's just, a, it's just a way to call something that has characters in it, like letters in it. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, when I commented 
out the the B equals log 10 and then ran it, no, nothing showed up. But when I do, like you have the comment and saying next lines runs a regression, that actually shows up in my console like it does in yours. It does, yeah. Uh, um, if, but if you I did, think if, if it has a, I think if it has a line after it that will run, it will show. But if it doesn't, like it, you know, like if I connect it just like this, where it's adjacent to a, a real command, it will show. Mm -hmm. But if it's not adjacent to a command, I think it won't show. It'll just run the command. Got it. Thank and, you. Yeah, it's a little a little finicky like that. Okay, I'm going to move on. If you have further questions, please go ahead and put them in chat. All right, so now we want to talk about functions because uh, functions do all the work in R. And functions in R are much the same as they are in math. In other words, they take some sort of input and then they return some sort of output. For example, in the, the math function, you know, you remember functions f of x, x is the input, and then x squared is what it does, so it will return the square of x as the output. Similarly, we have functions like mean in R where you supply a vector of numbers as the input, and then the output is the mean of those numbers, okay? In R terminology and in general in programming te terminology, we, we refer to the inputs to the function as arguments, okay? So when I'm talking about the things that I'm feeding into the argument and into the function, I'm gonna call them arguments. Um, in order to access the help file for an R function, you precede the name of the function with a question mark in the R console. All right, so we're going to look at the help file file for log by typing question mark log in the you can put in the script editor if you like. But normally we don't put this in a script editor because you wouldn't look at it more than once, so you can also put it into the console. Oops, but I just want you to look at question mark log. So this opens in the bottom right of our studio the help file for log. Um, this is the package that log comes from. So uh, this tells you that it comes with base. And remember, base is just R itself. Uh, and then you'll get a description, which tells you, you know, a brief summary of what the log function does. And then you'll see this usage section. And here you'll find the arguments that you can supply to log. So first is X, which is just uh, either a number or a vector of numbers and then the base. So for instance, you can have log 10, base 10, or you can have log base two. Um, if, if in this section, you see an argument already has something equal to it, that is the default. So in other words, if you run log and you do not specify base, right? Then it'll automatically the make the base exp1, which is the e, Euler's number, 2.71, that number. So that will be the base if you do not specify, all right? So again, if you see an equals and then a value in this usage section, that is the default. So the default for log is to be the natural log, all right? But we can override that by specifying a different base, okay? Here in the argument section, you'll get a more of a description of what each argument is. The tails gives you more details about how the function actually works. So if you need to you know, understand maybe the formulas behind it, you might find it here. Value is what the function returns, right? So here it'll tell you it returns a vector of the same length of x that contains the logarithms basically of those numbers, okay? And the, the other things I want you to notice are C also, which are related functions. And then at the bottom are examples, so you can literally just copy and paste these examples into the console to see how they work. Um, usually you should be able to copy these directly and they should work without any other code, okay? All right, so whenever you, if you know the name of a function, you, you need to know how it works, question mark, and then the name. I think I went over everything there. All right, so when we specify arguments to our functions, there are two ways we can do it. We can specify them by name or we can specify them by position. So once again, we have the log function, right? 
remember that its two arguments were x and base, all right? And x is the numbers you want to take the log of, and base is the base for the logarithm. Okay. So I can either specify them by name like this, where I say x equals 100, base equals 10, or I can just uh, omit the name of the argument, x equals and base equals, and just put the values. So this is uh, saying that I want to take the logarithm of eight with base two. If you omit the argument name like this, you have to put them in the right order. And that order is the order that they're listed here. So the first argument is x and the second argument is gonna be base, all right? So you can omit those names, but you, you just gotta be careful about the order. If you specify the name, you can actually put them in whatever order you want. So I could have put base first and then x equals as long as I have those names in there, okay? So it's really useful to study those help files to understand how you can uh, run these functions. And you can then start to you know, use less coding by omitting the names eventually. Okay. Okay, so now I wanna talk about vectors because vectors are the fundamental data structure in R. And they are one dimensional, meaning it's just like an array, like a single dimensional array of numbers. And they all have to be the same type or homogeneous. So they all have to be, for instance, numbers, or they all have to be strings, or they all have to be logical values. There are four kinds of vectors. Logical are true false values, integers, which are you know, numbers without any decimals, double, which are numbers with decimals, and then character, which are strings, which contain letters like this, all right? So in a vector, you cannot mix and match these types. They have to be all one type. Okay, so <clears throat> there are many, 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 many ways to create vectors in R. Um, if you just need to throw some values together to form a vector, the C function is what you use to do that, okay? So here, for example, I am creating a vector of three numbers right here. So I, this is the name of the object, then I'm assigning it with the arrow, and then I, the C function is what combines these three numbers into a single vector, all right? And then I look, if I look at it, I can see that first vec has three values, one, three, five, okay? I can also create vectors of strings just like this. So this is, these are some words. Are there's four strings in this character vector? I can use the length function to give me the, how many elements are in the vector. So there are four elements of this vector. This is a logical vector, okay? So logical vectors have true false values. So remember this first vec has the values one, three, five. And here I'm saying 135, is it greater than 222? And the result of that is one is not greater than two, so that's false. But three is greater than two, so that's true. And five is greater than two, so that's true as well. This then is actually a logical vector. So it is a vector of three values, false, true, true. Okay? And that results from this comparison. I can also just direct, I can create this vector directly with the C function typing up false, true, true if I want it as well. But what I want you to realize is that when you compare vectors, what's returned itself is a logical vector, okay? So that's just throwing together values with C, all right? You can put any set of values as long as they're all the same type in, into C and it'll create a vector out of them. But sometimes you don't wanna specify every single value because it's a very predictable sequence of elements. And in that case, you want to use either the rep function or the seek function, all right? Let me tell you what those do. So rep is for repeating elements. So if you need to create a vector of zeros, uh, let's say where there are three zeros, that's what I'm doing here. So rep zero times is the argument that tells you how many times do I want to repeat this number? And here I'm saying it's three. So this creates a vector of three zeros, but it doesn't have to be a number. I could supply a string, right? And here I'm saying repeat the string ABC four times, okay? 
that is for repetitive elements. But sometimes you want to instead create a vector of sequential elements, right? So here I'm using seek, which stands for sequence, to create a vector of numbers that goes from one to five in increments of two, right? So it goes one plus two is three plus two is five. So this also creates a vector of three values. Remember, I can also specify arguments by position. So if I omit these from, to, and by, I can just use the position. This is from 10 to five, I'm at two zero, excuse me, by increments of negative five, right? So the first value will be 10. The second value will be five because it's minus five. And the third value will be zero, again, minus five. The colon operator is shorthand for sequence, and it means every contiguous number between the first value and the last value. So this is just giving sequence from three, two, seven by one, right? Three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> okay. One thing you can also do is you can nest functions within other functions, right? So it will first evaluate the function on the inside. Right, so I, here I have a sequence function nested inside of a rep, rep function. What does sequence one, three, one give me? Well, remember the first argument is from, then two, then by. So this is from one to three by one. So that's one, two, three. So this resolves to one, two, three. The output of seek is one, two, three. I'm gonna repeat one, two, three, two times, because thou that's inside of rep. And so I get one, two, three repeated two times. OK, so what I want you to practice is I want you to create the vector four, five, six in three different ways using C, seek, and the colon operator. Then I want you to try creating the vector two, two, and one, one in at least two different ways, all right? I'm gonna give you a minute to try these things. It's okay if you don't finish and we'll come back and discuss the answer in just a moment. I'll give you a minute to try these on your own. All right, so create four, five, six in three different ways and then try creating the vector two, two, one, one in at least two different ways. And when we come back after a minute, I'll tell you how I could do it. Okay, time is up. Let me now start sharing again. Okay, so first I wanted you to create four, five, six using C, right? So with C, you just literally type C and then in the parentheses, you're gonna put four, five, six. That's easy. Then using seek, I can also do from four, right? I can type it out like from equals four two equals six, and I could say by equals one, right? Or I could have omitted it and just put seek four, six, one. And then I can use the colon operator, right? And I could do four colon six to go four, five, six. Now to create two, two, one, one, there are many different ways to do that. I could literally just type two, two, one, one like this, right? Or I could do seek and I could a C and then I could do rep two, two, comma, rep, two, one, two, right? This resolves to two, two. This resolves to one, one, and then C puts it all together. There are many, many different ways I could have done either one of these. So if you did it a different way and it works, that's great. It doesn't matter to me. I just want you to think about different ways that you can create vectors.
Subsetting vectors. All right, so elements of a vector can be accessed or subset by specifying a vector of numbers at least one or of length one or greater inside of brackets. Okay, so here I've created a vector called A, which is the numbers from 10 to one decreasing by minus one. All right, so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. These parentheses around here, um, that'll show you immediately the output of this command. If I didn't put the parentheses, I would have to type A after this, and then it would show you 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. <clears throat> now I created this. I can access various elements of it using brackets, right? So if I want to access the second element of this vector, um, I put two in brackets, right? And the second element of A is nine. But I can also put a vector of numbers inside there, right? So seek one five resolves to one, two, three, four, five, okay? And so this is saying, give me the first five elements of A, right? Which is these 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, okay? So again, you can put a vector inside of the brackets. And I don't have to take contiguous elements either. I can take the first, the fir third, and the fourth element by uh, putting it inside of C, right? And so this gives me 10, 8, 7, okay? So to practice, let's create the vector y as the integer is counting down from 10 to 1. And then let's access the second, fifth, and seventh element of this vector y. Okay, so first we're going to create y and it's going to be 10 down to one, right? So I'm going to do seek and it's going to be from equals 10. Oops, I don't know why I'm talking. 10, 2 equals 1, and then by equals minus 1. Okay, again, I could have just typed 10, comma, 1, comma, minus 1 as well. Okay, when I run that, I'll get a numeric vector now y. You'll see this in the environment. Then I wanted to access I think, two, five, and seven. I'm just going to say that for now. Let's access the second, fifth, and seventh elements. So I'm sorry, let me slow down. I, I put y, then my square brackets, and then inside of c, I want two, five, and seven. That'll access the second, the fifth, and the seventh element of y. Okay. And I, at this point, you may be wondering, why are we talking about vectors? Why are we talking about all this? It will become clear in a minute because eventually we're going to have data sets of vectors and you'll need to be able to access different elements of those vectors. Okay, So I promise this will all come to be useful soon. OK, all right. Something that's very useful that many of you will be using is what's called conditional selection, which means that I'm subsetting by value. I'm looking at the values and seeing if they meet some condition in order to subset. Okay. So for instance, um, I'm sorry, the way we're going to do this is through logical vectors, true, false, right? And this is known as logical subsetting. Okay. So here, for instance, I have this vector called scores, which is four elements, and it's just these numbers 55, 24, 43, and 10. If I use a logical vector to subset, it will pull the true elements and it will leave behind the false elements. So it selects only the true elements. So it'll only select 24 and 43 in that case, okay? But remember, when I do comparisons, sometimes those result in logical vectors, right? So scores is these four numbers. And if I type scores less than 30, it'll compare each of those numbers to 30. So that is not less than 30, false. It is, that is true, false, true, right? So 24 and 10 are the only numbers in scores that are less than 30. So that's why it's false, true, false, true. So if I, the result of this is this vector, false, true, false, true. So I can stick this directly inside the square brackets this will resolve first to false, true, false, true, and it'll only pull out the true values, which are 24 and 10, okay? So this is a way that you can select elements of a vector based on whether their values meet some sort of condition, okay? 
Um, use conditional selection to find the numbers in Y that when you multiply them by two, the result is greater than 15. I know that sounds weird, but it's actually a simple code, okay? So again, we know we're gonna use the square brackets because we're subsetting. And we wanna know which numbers in Y, when I multiply them by two, result in a number that's greater than 15. And so for instance, if I multiply 10 by two, it's 20, that's greater than 15. And nine, by two, nine times two is 18, also greater than 15. Uh, so what I can do is I can say Y times two, where the times is the asterisk, and then I put greater than 15. So this right here, if I just type this by itself, that results in this vector of trues and falses. And I can see that the first three elements are true and the rest of them are false. So when I run this whole command, it's going to pull out the first three elements of Y and 9, 8. And those indeed are the numbers that when you multiply them by two, the result is greater than 15. All right, let me pause. Are there any questions at this point? Any questions? Okay, if you have questions, um, of course, you can keep asking them in the chat and see if I Okay, we're gonna now talk about importing and exporting data. Okay, we're finally getting to some real data, right? Okay. Um, in general, R works most easily with data sets that are stored as text files, all right? Um, typically, the values in the text files are separated, or what we call delimited, by some character. And that character can be spaces, or it can be tabs, or oftentimes it's going to be commas. So these are very commonly used for R, these comma separated values file, or CSV files, where the values um, in each of the columns are separated by commas, okay? Um, R provides several functions to help you read in data, the data files that are stored as text files. Um, we're gonna be using read.csv, which is used to read in data sets stored as CSV files. If you have data sets that are delimited by tabs or by spaces, you can use read.delim. There's also another function called read.table, they all have very similar functionality. One of them will probably work. For instance, if you have a tab separated file, you can use read.delim and then specify a tab in the set argument. Today, we're only gonna be working with CSV files. Um, so we're gonna be mainly concentrating on read.csv. Read.csv assumes that the first row of the text file is a row of variable names. So it assumes that you have, um, the names of your variables as the very first row of that data file. If that happens to not be true and there's no header at all, then there's an argument in read.csv that you can set to false, header equals false. Therefore, it will not, it'll read the first line as data, not as the uh, column names, okay? Um, we're gonna be using a file that you're gonna be reading over the internet today. Uh, typically, it's going to be located on your hard drive somewhere. So the normal usage of read.csv is you're going to store this in some object. Here I'm calling it data, right? Then I'm assigning to it read.csv. In quotes, I'm going to put the path, you know, if it's stored in some set of directories, that path. And then finally, the file name with .csv at the end of it, all right? So this is the location of the file and then the file name. All of that in quotes. And then that will store the result into this uh, object called data. Here I have a specification if it's a tab delimited file. Remember I said that there's this sep equals argument and this is how you specify a tab, uh, this backslash T, and then that stores it into this object I called that, that, that dot tab. Okay, if you wanna follow along the rest of the workshop, you're going to have to copy this line right here. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to create this data set dat underscore CSV. Uh, you're going to read it directly from our website. So one nice thing is that read.csv can read over the internet. So I just want you to copy this whole line right here, put it into R, 
and run it. Okay. I'll give you a moment to do Again, a lot of the rest of the work stuff depends on you running this line. So if you haven't already, go ahead and try to run this line right here. Just copy and paste it into there. Again, if you're having trouble copying and pasting because every time you click, uh, it goes to the next slide, hit the K key on your keyboard and it'll stop. Okay. I'm gonna keep going. Oops, sorry. Okay, if you need to export data, instead of read.csv, you're gonna use write.csv, right? Um, you can usually write one object directly to a CSV file. So um, usually this will be like uh, what we call a data frame, which I'll describe later on in a little bit. Um, but this will usually be some kind of data frame. And then this is the name of the file that you're writing to, right? You can specify a location and then a file name here, All right? There we go. Um, if you have a lot of objects in your um, R environment that you want to save, you can also use the save function, which creates an .r data file. And then you can load all of those objects using the load function. But you can't look at them directly outside of R like you can this CSV file. So you, uh, you can save them using this, but you can't look at them directly. But you can load them into R later. We're not going to be using save and load today. We're just going to be using read. Okay, but it's there if you need it. Okay, uh, now I know a lot of you are not going to have your data necessarily stored as CSV files or text files. If you have your data stored as an Excel file, that's not a format that R reads natively. You're going to have to download some package to read in Excel files, and I recommend this read Excel package, right? If you have your data stored as a Stata, SAS, or SPSS data set, the Haven package can process all of those and import them directly into R, okay? So install these packages if you have a lot of data stored in these other formats. Another alternative though, is to go inside of Stata and then save it as a CSV or go inside of SAS or Excel and then save it as a CSV. And then you can just directly read it into R without using these packages, okay? Okay, any questions on importing and exporting? Oh, somebody put that code in the chat. Thank you, David, that's very kind. If you aren't able to load the data set by copying the code, Dave, David put it in the chat for us. Um, so you can copy that. And put it in. Yes, question. How do we find if our uh, import was successful? Ah, good question. You should see dat underscore CSV in the environment then. If you don't, or you know, when you run the line, no errors come up like this. But yeah, you'll always see it here. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Cindy, can I ask okay. a question about the importing? Yes. So you know how you said sometimes the first row um, gets read as sort of variable names and stuff, but Correct. sometimes I've noticed that in some files the first the um, column is actually a duplicate of like patient identifier columns. Is there a way to get rid of the first row as you import? Or is yes. that something we only do later on? Yes, I, I won't discuss it, but if you look at read.csv really fast, there is an option called skip. And that tells you how many rows should it skip before reading in the data. So you can use that, for example. Okay. 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 Any other One one more yes, question, if yes, you don't mind. Sure. So when you import or export the data, let's say I have a SAS file and I have some formats for, you know, in the file, would the import uh, also import the formats? I don't honestly know if if you you're going to have to definitely use Haven to do that because Haven is pretty smart. For instance, I know it'll load state of value labels, which are the same thing as SAS formats. But I I. I I think it can, but I can't guarantee it. But look into this Haven package. I'm not 100% sure, honestly. Okay, thank you. Good question, though. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I know you may, uh, others of you may have, but we got to keep moving, unfortunately. Okay. Um, data frames. Very good. Final. All right. So data frames are the structure where we're going to store our data sets. And um, 
the object that was created by re.csv is in fact a data frame. And data frames are rectangular structures where the columns are variables and the rows are observations. Now, one nice thing about data frames is that the columns are vectors themselves, but it can be a mixture of different vectors, right? So for instance, this first column, the name column is a character vector or a string vector. And these, these other three columns, weight, height, and age, they're all numeric vectors. And this disease column is a logical vector. And so you can mix different kinds of vectors in a data frame, um, which is very good for data sets because a lot of the data sets that you're gonna read in are gonna have a mix of numbers and character data, okay? But just keep in mind that, you know, when you're reading this in, for instance, from Excel, you don't wanna have, you know, graphs and, you know, lots of line breaks or, you know, empty rows. It really try to make it rectangular as possible. All right, so if you wanna look at a data frame in R, there's a lot of different ways. Um, you can use the view function, which will open up a spreadsheet style view of the data set. Um, and you can either write you know, the command view, but what most people do to view it is you just go to the environment in R Studio, and on the name of it, you click on the name of the data frame. And when I click on it, you can see that it opens up this spreadsheet um, where I can then actually view the contents of it. Okay, you can see though that what R actually did is it ran view, capital V view on it. So when I click on it, it actually views, it runs the view command on that underscore CSV. Okay. Um, you can also take a look at just the beginning or the end of the data set using head and tail. Head looks at the first few rows, tail looks at the last few rows. You can specify how many rows. So the first argument is what data frame you want to look at or what object you wanna look at. And then the next argument is how many rows. So this is looking at the first two rows of that underscore CSV. This is looking at the last eight rows of that underscore CSV. So sometimes if you have really, really large data sets with hundreds of thousands or millions of rows, you don't want to open up the spreadsheet. You just want to look to make sure everything looks correct with head, for instance. Okay. Okay. Subsetting data frames. So now remember, previously we were subsetting with these square brackets with vectors, but vectors are only one dimensional. Data frames are two dimensional, so we need to be able to specify which row and which column now we want. So inside the brackets, we can put two numbers. The first number is going to represent which rows we want. The second number is going to represent which columns we want. And both of these can be vectors. Okay. If you omit one of them, that's the same thing as saying all of them. So if I omit rows, that means all rows. And if I omit columns, that means all columns. Okay. So let's take a look. So here I'm actually creating a data frame manually using the data frame function. You're not going to use this very often, maybe once in a while. Usually you're going to create data frames directly by reading them in, like with read.csv. But here I'm just going to create a really small data frame for, um, for demonstration. It has three vectors in it, patient or three columns, patient, height, and diabetic. And you can see that patient is strings. All right. So it is uh, three rows and three columns. It's three by three. So I here I'm saying, just give me row three, column two, right? So row three is the last row, column two, height is the second column. So that's gonna be the third value in height, 66. But remember both rows and columns can be vectors. This is saying, give me rows one and two. And I can also call out columns by their name directly, okay? So I don't have to call it by number, I can call it by name. So this says, give me the first two rows of the column height, right? First two rows of column height, 72 and 61. Remember, if I omit either rows or column, that means all of them. So here I've omitted the rows. So that means all rows. Give me all rows of the two columns, patient and diabetic. So here I created a vector of two columns using their names, patient and diabetic. So that gives me all the rows for the first and the last column. Okay, 
So we already have math, I'm sorry, we already have dat underscore CSV loaded now into R. What I want you to try to do is extract the second, fifth, and 10th row of the variable math in the dat underscore CSV data set, okay? So I'll do this with you. We want uh, to subset dat underscore CSV. So we're gonna use the square brackets, right? I think, I can't remember which rows I have, two, five, and 10. So I want the rows two, five, and 10. So I'm gonna have to use C to specify them because they're not contiguous, right? So I'm gonna put two, five, and 10 inside of C for the rows that goes before the comma. And then after the comma, I wanted the variable math. So I can just type out math in quotes, right? And this is gonna be the second, fifth, and 10th values in the column math in dat CSV, right? So if I look at math, it's this 41, this 40, and this 46. All right, that's one way to subset uh, a column, but the more common way that you're gonna subset a column in a data frame is with the dollar sign operator, okay? And this dollar sign operator extracts one of the columns and turns it into a vector, okay? So here, I, uh, I have, this is the name of the data set I was working with, my data, dollar sign, and then I put the name of a column, not in quotes though, all right? So remember, one of my columns is called height, and I can specify it. Uh, I can extract that column specifically with this dollar sign, but not with quotes, okay? That, if I just do this, it'll extract the entire column. But again, I can subset, this is now a vector, right? You can see that when, once I specify this, uh, my, data, my data dollar sign height, it creates a vector. What if I only want like the second and third element of this vector? I can then put two, colon three, which is two comma three, right? It'll give me the second and third element, just like that. So let's try this again, extract the second, fifth and 10th rows of math, but this time using the dollar sign operator, okay? So here, I'm just gonna type that underscore CSV again, a dollar sign. Look, our studio actually tells you, it knows what are the column names in there. So. Um, I could, you know, if I forgot the names of them, I could just do this and I can even select math there, right? Then I want to select the elements two, five, and 10. So I put the square brackets, two, comma, five, comma, 10. Okay. There you go, same thing. All right, so honestly, you're going to see most people, if you need to extract like a, a column, they'll almost always do it with dollar sign rather than this way. Okay, but again, there are always, almost always multiple ways to do the same thing and all. Okay, uh, next, sometimes you're gonna wanna rename your uh, columns uh, because the column names are not, for instance, descriptive enough, or maybe there are no column names in your data file and you're gonna have to give them some. Um, you're gonna use the call names function to do that. Uh, and you put the name of the data frame inside as the input to call names. Now, call names can do two different things depending on whether or not you use the arrow. If you don't use the arrow, call names on the data frame will just tell you what the column names are. So it just returns the names of the columns. However, if you do call names and then put an arrow, which means you're assigning something to it, then you can rename the columns, okay? So here I'm showing you that functionality. Here, without an arrow, it just tells me what the column names are. But let's say I want to capitalize the column names. I can then put call names my data again, assign it with the arrow, and then put the vector of names that I want to use here. Okay. And then you can see when I run call names again without the arrow, it's going to report the names which are now capitalized. See here. Okay. If you want to change just one column name at a time, you subset it using vector indexing like this, right? So here I'm saying, I just want to change the third name to diabetes. So I'm changing diabetic to diabetes here by subsetting the third element of this vector, right? This returns a vector of three elements and I want to change the third one. And that's where it changed to diabetes, okay? All right, 
Um, sometimes you want to look at the structure of an object. Um, dim gives you the dimensions of the object, basically the number of rows and the number of columns. Um, you can often see that here also. So this is the number of rows and this is the number of columns, right? So our studio gives a lot of this for you for free, which is very nice. Um, what, uh, another thing you can do to look at your data set is SGR, which stands for structure. And the structure command will tell you <laughs> what kind of vector each column is. It'll also you know, give you an overall summary of the entire data frame. So it's telling you it's three rows of three columns, but then it'll tell you what each column is. So it's here, it's telling me that patient is a character vector. Here, it's telling me that height is numeric and diabetes is numeric. And it'll give me the first few values. This is only three rows, so it gives me everything. But if this were 20 rows, it would give me just the first few. So we can use str uh, on that CS underscore CSV and let's see what happens. Okay, I go into my script. I'm gonna write str and then parentheses. Then I'm gonna type dat underscore CSV. When I run that, it's gonna run structure on this data frame that we've been using. And here we can see its dimensions again. But now I can see each of the columns and I can see how they've been stored. <laughs> this can be very useful. For instance, if you expect your, your, one of your variables to be like integer or numeric, but it's been read in as character. And you know, a lot of functions like mean or variance, they won't work unless the, uh, the vector or the column is numeric. So sometimes you, this is a good way to check that everything is read in as you expect. Okay, um, our studio can provide this to you for free. This little blue button right here, if you click it, it actually runs STR for you also, all right? So it just kind of creates this thing that you can open and close, which is basically running STR, okay? Okay. All right, uh, one thing that almost all of you are gonna have to do at some point is you're gonna have to add new variables to the data frame, right? So whatever data set you get, a lot of times it doesn't have the variables ready for analysis. You're gonna have to do some kind of processing to them before you run your analysis. Um, so you can add them directly by declaring them on the spot like this. So here currently before there is no column called log height, but I can create it just by doing my data dollar sign, the name of a new column, and then I assign it something. And here I'm saying log height is the logarithm of the column that's called height in my data. Okay, so here I'm just adding a new column called log height. Now, when I do call names on my data, you can see it has indeed added a new column called log height. If you try to add a column that has the incorrect number of rows, R will throw back an error. Okay, so remember this. Um, data set my data only has three rows. And here I'm trying to add a new column called Z, but it's gonna be the vector of zeros repeated five times. So it's five elements, but each of these columns in my data only has three rows. And so R gives me an error here. It says replacement has five rows, but the data only has three. And so it won't actually add anything. This will fail in other words. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so here are some useful functions that you might find you're going to be using when you're creating new variables. We've already gone over log. If you need to rank your values, you can use min rank. If you need to create a categorical variable from a continuous variable, you can use the cut function. Scale standardizes variables where you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. We're going to use this in just a moment. If you need to create lag and leads, uh, there's lag and lead cumulative sums, row means, and row sums. So if you need to take um, the mean across columns or the sums across columns, use these functions. Okay, let's practice because this is something a lot of you are gonna do. I want you to add um, a variable called CMath to the dat underscore CSV data set that is the mean-centered math variable. 
So to create this variable, we're gonna subtract the mean of math from the math variable itself, okay? So let's try this. So it's, I'm gonna create a mean-centered math, right? So I'm gonna call it C math for centered math, okay? So remember, I can just automatically create it like this. And by, uh, I use the assignment arrow. And then what I wanna do is I wanna take the original math variable, which is just dat underscore CSV math, and then subtract the mean of that variable, which I can get by using the mean function and then sticking this very code inside, right? So this says create a new variable called CMath that is the original math variable minus its mean. This is, this is gonna be CMath. Then I want you to create another variable called ZMath. And ZMath, what I want you to do is I want you to take CMath and divide it by its standard deviation, which is gonna be using uh, the SD function. And you use this slash to do divide. All right, we'll do it together. So I'm gonna create ZMath by taking CMath and dividing CMath by its own standard deviation. Okay, so I'm gonna do dat underscore CSV, ZMath. Okay. And then what I wanna do is I wanna take CMath and then divide by its standard deviation. So I do SD and then in parentheses, I put uh, dat underscore CSV dollar sign CMath again. Okay, so this says create a new variable called ZMath that is CMath divided by its own standard deviation. Okay. And what we've created right here with ZMath, this is the standardized version of math, right? We've centered it, and then we've divided by its standard deviation, and we created ZMath. Now, I could have done this just by using the scale function, but I want you to get used to, you know, different ways of doing the same thing. You may forget scale, but you'll probably remember mean and SD. So, but I just wanna show you, I, there's another way that I could do this. I'm gonna create a second ZMath2, right? Just by using the scale function on math, the original math variable, okay? So let me, I'm gonna do this with you again. So I'm gonna do dat underscore CSV dollar sign ZMath2. And then what I'm gonna to assign to it, right, using the arrow. I'm gonna write out the scale function here. And then inside, I'm gonna put dat underscore CSV dollar sign math, okay? Again, this says create a ZMath2 variable by running the scale function on the math variable, okay? So I've added three new columns to dat underscore CSV, right? You can see CMath, ZMath, and ZMath2. And you can see that ZMath and ZMath2, don't worry about this, it's, about that, you can see that these are exactly the same. So I've, I've shown you two different ways that you can standardize one of your columns. Okay. okay. Any questions on creating variables or anything that we've gone over so far? Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, actually, let me see, how long is this? Yeah, let's do this section, then we'll take a break. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk about some data management here. And um, we, you know, we always recommend that you spend some time before your analysis, making your data nice and clean and tidy. Uh, and that will generally save you time in the long run when you run your analyses. So, you know, try to cut down your data set to only those observations that you need and only those columns that you need. Um, on, on, on the other hand, sometimes you'll have multiple data sets that, for instance, you'll need to merge together or append together, combine in some way. And then also try to make sure that uh, your variables are free of errors, such as impossible values like minus 9999 or values that are used for missing codes or something like that. Okay. So the package uh, we're gonna use, dplyr, has a lot of easy to use data management functions, all right? So 
what I want you to do at this point is load the dplyr package using the library function, if you haven't already. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I put library and then dplyr like that. Also copy it directly from the slides. Um, as long as you know you don't see any errors, that probably means it's been loaded correctly. Okay, okay. so one of the functions from dplyr that's really useful is filter. And filter will select rows that meet some condition. Okay, so you have a data frame, and let's say you here I have a data frame of dogs, and I have their weights, their sexes, and let's say where they are in location wise. And I have their names as well. And let's say I only want to select the dogs that weigh more than 40 pounds, right? So here, the filter function, the first argument is the data set. And then after that, you can put some condition, right? And here I'm saying weight greater than 40. Filter knows that this weight variable is inside of dog data, which makes it easy to use. There's another function that comes with BASAR that's called subset that does pretty much the same thing as filter, but you have to do a little bit more typing to use it. So filter is kind of a nice shorthand uh, way to subset rows of your data set. Um, so here, I've only selected the two dogs, Buddy and Daisy, that weigh more than 40 pounds, okay? But you can use more complex conditions than that. So here, for instance, this is saying uh, filter those dogs that are located either in the north or the south and are female, right? So this is a more complex condition. They have to be north or south and they have to have female, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to just, let's do just the first exercise here which is create a data set from that underscore CSV called low read that contains observations where the read score is less than or equal to 50. So we're gonna have to create a new object here called low read using the filter function on that underscore CSV. Okay, and we wanna select those rows where read is less than 50. Okay, so I wanted you to call it low read like this low underscore read. Okay, we're going to assign to that. We're going to use filter on the original data set that underscore CSV. That's the first argument. And we want to filter out those observations that have a read score that is, are less than 50. Okay, very simple, right? Name of the data set, condition. And again, filter knows that read is inside of that underscore CSV, right? Read is one of my columns. Okay, and then when I run that, you can see that it created a new data set called low read, a new data frame, in fact, that has 83 observations. So 83 of the 200 observations have a read score less than 50. Uh, we're not gonna do this exercise in the interest of time. Okay, so now there we just learned how to subset rows. We also need to learn how to subset columns. Right, so sometimes you want to reduce the number of variables in your data set by getting rid of some of the variables you don't need. The select function from dplyr can help you do this. Um, all you do again is you put in the name of the data set first, and then you just list the columns that you want to keep after it. Right, so previously my dog data set had four columns ID, weight, sex, and location. Here I'm saying just take ID and sex. Sometimes it's easier to select out a few columns and keep most of them. So, you know, let's say you had 100 columns and you just want to get rid of two of them. You don't want to write out 98 column names. Instead, you can use this minus in front of C to select out the columns that you don't want. So this says remove ID and sex and give me everything else. Okay. So what's left over is the weight and location. But this is the select function from dplyr, all right? So filter to uh, subset rows, select to subset columns. Okay. 
Sometimes uh, you are gonna have multiple data sets that you need to stack on top of one another, right? They have the same variables, but they have different observations of those variables. And you just wanna put one on top of the other. one. Um, the function you can use to stack or append data sets is the rbind function, okay? But it has a restriction. It won't work unless the column names are the same between the two data frames that you're trying to combine. Okay, so I had my data frame called dog data that had these four columns. Now I'm creating a new data frame called more dogs that has two more rows of data, but it has the exact same four column names. Okay, um, you can see again, yeah, four, the four columns are exactly the same between the two data sets. Then if I put the two data frames inside of R bind, R will then append them together, right? So these two, Jack and Luna, are the new ones that are appended from more dogs. Okay, so R binds can help you append data sets. We're not going to do this exercise uh, in the interest of time, but it's not that it wasn't. It's not that not that uh, difficult to do. Um, I'm not going to go over merging too much today because it's a little more involved and we are running out of time. So instead, I just want to point out that if you do need to merge, um, I recommend using either the inner join function from dplyr or the merge function that comes with base R. They both work very well. The one thing, though, is that you'll need to have some variable that matches between the two data sets. So when you merge data sets, you're adding more columns, right? You're not stacking rows, you're adding more columns. And you need to link the rows in the two data sets by some kind of ID variable. So you'll need to have some ID that is common between the two data sets that you're merging together when you do this. And then you can use either inner join from dplyr or merge from the base R uh, to do this kind of merge. All right, but we're, we're not going to really go into detail today. Okay, um, I do want to talk about missing values, though, as a last topic before we take the break. Missing values in R are represented by the symbol NA. Okay, so you cannot use NA for variable names, for example. This is a reserved symbol. If you have blank fields in a text file, they will be converted generally to NA when you load them into R. Okay. But in a lot of data sets, they uh, have codes for missing values like minus 99 to denote missing value, right? When you load that into R, R is, got, is not going to know that minus 99 means missing. So it'll be read in as minus 99. So a lot of times, one of the first things you should do when you're doing your data management is convert all of those missing data codes into NA. Okay. So for instance, um, this is one way where I can do it. Here I'm saying, find all of the values in weight that are equal to minus 99. Remember this returns a true false. So if any of them are actually equal to minus 99, it'll return true. And for those that are actually equal to minus 99, I'm going to set it to NA, okay? So, uh, sorry, I should have showed you earlier one of these does have a minus 99 here, Luna, the last one. All of the others are not minus 99, so this will be false, 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 but this last one will be true when I do this. And so it'll pull out that last score, the minus 99 itself, and set it to NA. So now it's been converted to NA, okay? So this is one way you can use this kind of coding to change all of the minus 99 values to NA. Be careful with NAs because they're contagious. And so when you perform an operation on something that contains NA, a lot of times you'll get back an NA itself, right? So for example, um, here I'm adding one plus two plus NA. And when I do that, you can see that the result itself is NA, okay? Um, it cannot tell whether something is smaller or bigger than NA either. NA really means undefined. So it could mean any number between negative infinity to infinity. R has no idea what number it is. So when I'm trying to compare a number to NA, it also result, results in NA, right? So here I'm comparing one, two, three NA greater than two. The NA greater than two resolves to NA. 
when you a lot of functions like mean will return NA if one of the values is NA. That's annoying, but fortunately, a lot of functions like mean or sum have an argument called na.rm. And this argument means if you set it to true, if you set na.rm to true, it'll first remove the missing values before it performs the sum or the mean. So here, remember that one of my dog weights is na. So if I do mean dog weight na.rm equals true, it will calculate the mean of the non-missing values, these, right? But without that na.rm equals true, it will return na because one of the values is na, okay? So just keep that in mind. You cannot check for equality to na because it means undefined. So you cannot use equals equals to check for na. Watch. So here I have x and I've given it three values, one, two, and na, right? So this is a vector where the third value is missing. If I do x equals equals na, it just returns NAs because it doesn't know what NA means. It could be negative infinity or infinity. It could be one, it could be two. We don't know, so R says it's just gonna be NA. So you cannot find NAs using equals equals. You have to use the is dot NA function, okay? So just keep that in mind. If you're looking for is dot, uh, if you're looking for NAs, use is dot NA, okay. In dat underscore CSV, the variable science contains minus 99 values to signify missing. How can you identify which rows have minus 99 values? So let's start with that. So as I said, inside of dat underscore CSV in the science variable, you can see these minus 99 values. First, what can we do to identify them? Well, as we were just saying, you need to use is.na right, to identify which ones of those are in fact NAs. So I can put is.na. Inside the parentheses, I'm going to put dat underscore CSV dollar sign science, okay? That is going to return a true-false vector, and the elements that are true are uh, the ones that are NA. I'm sorry. They're not NA yet, I, I, I messed up. Sorry, we wanna find the um, minus 99s. I, I apologize, that was bad. So here, this will find the, the values that are equal to minus 99. So equals equals is the way you check for equality in R, right? A single equals means assign this value, but double equals means check if it's equal to the value on the right. So if I do that, underscore CSV dollar sign science equals equals minus 99, it will return a vector of true false values and the trues are where it found a minus 99. The next step then is I wanna convert all of these minus 99 values in science to NA, right? So I'm gonna take this logical vector and put it inside of brackets after dot underscore science like that, right? So I have the science column here. This is gonna return a true fault vector. Whatever's true is gonna be pulled out. And all of those values that are pulled out, I wanna turn into NA like this. So this is how you're gonna basically convert your missing data codes to NA values, just like this. Okay, so now if I look at that underscore CSV, those are now NAs, okay? And if I want to now take the mean of science, ignoring the NAs, I type mean, that underscore CSV, dollar sign science, comma, NA dot RM equals true. And in R, you can, um, you can abbreviate true and false to capital T and capital F, right? Now this is the mean of science, ignoring those missing values. Okay. All right. Any questions about anything we've gone over so far? Okay, then right now we're gonna take a five minute break. Um, so feel free to do whatever you need. I'm gonna 
grab a quick drink and then um, I will be back to answer any questions. So just give me one moment, I will be back and I'll he'll be here to answer questions, but we're gonna restart the workshop in five minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for coming back from break. I know it's a long uh, session. We're gonna move on now to some data analysis commands. Okay, so uh, first we're gonna start with some descriptive statistic commands. So some common numeric summaries for continuous variables are mean, median, variance. Uh, and to do those, we're gonna have the mean function, the median function, and var for variance. If you need the standard deviation, we already use this. You can use SD. Um, we've already used mean also, in fact, so the only one that's really new to you is our median and variance. Summary will provide, um, if you use it on a numeric vector, will provide the min, the max, the mean, the median, and the first and third quartiles. Let me show you. So here I created a new data set called blood test. I created it manually, and it has a combination of characters and numeric columns. So here's the mean function, here's the median function, here's the variance. So I'm just getting the mean, median, and variance of the age column. Then I use the summary function on one column here called test one, and it gives me the min and the max. It gives me the median and the mean, and it also gives me the first and the third quartiles. Okay, so those are all useful functions. Um, if you need to calculate the correlation between variables, you can use the core function. Um, and it's usually gonna be used on continuous variables and it assesses the linear correlation among them. If you put just two variables in them, it'll give you the correlation between those two variables, but you can also supply several variables at once, like a data frame of variables, and then it'll calculate a correlation matrix. So here I have the COR core function with just two columns, test one and test two, and this is just the correlation between those two. Here, I instead use the select function from dplyr, remember, which will pull out several columns. So I'm pulling out test one, test two, test three, and test four. So I'm getting the correlation matrix of those four variables now. All right, so I, I store that in scores, and then I um, calculate the correlation on scores, which has four columns, these four columns. Okay, so let's create a correlation table of the variables read, write, and math in depth underscore CSV. Okay, I'm gonna do this all in one step. Okay. So I'm gonna go core, uh, and then I'm gonna actually put select inside of here, right? Then I wanna select from the dat underscore CSV data set, and then the columns I wanted were read, write, and math. Read. Okay, so the select, function will resolve first. Remember, it resolves inside out. So select will then just return three columns. And then those three columns are now inside of core. It'll give me a matrix, relation matrix of those three variables, like this. Okay, easy. Frequency tables. So a lot of times you wanna count how many observations there are for different levels of categorical variables. Um, table is the function you can use to create a frequency table, and you can put uh, at least three variables in there to get three-way tables, but you can also just put one variable in there. So here uh, I put gender inside of table, and it tells me that there are six observations with, that are female and four observations that are male. Here I have hospital inside of table, and there are three two and five for the three hospitals. If you need proportions, um, you put the result of table inside prop.table. Okay, so often you'll just nest table inside of prop.table. So here I have the table function run on hospital inside of prop.table. And so three, two, five turned into proportions is 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. Um, of course, we can have cross tabs or cross tabulations, which are two-way or multi-way tables. 
and you just list more variables inside of tables if you want to have cross tabs. So here, I'm ha I want to know how many observations there are of each crossing of gender in a hospital, right? So I have two genders and three hospitals, and so there are two females in the hospital CLH. Okay. Now, if I have proportions, I can either get the proportions along, for instance, the rows, in which case I'll use margin equals one, or I can get proportions along the columns, in which case I'll do margin equals two. This time I save the result of table inside of my two way. Then to look at it, remember you just, to look at an object or the contents, you just supply the name of the object itself, right? So this created a table, a two way table. Then I can stick that table result inside of prop.table. Margin equals one says, give me row proportions. So this was the, the proportions of a single, I'm sorry, the proportions in a row will sum to one, right? So of female, 33% are in this hospital, 16% are in this hospital, 50% are in this hospital. I can also get column proportions where the column proportions will sum to one. So here I can say that 67% of those in CLH are female, 33% of those in CLH are male, okay? Um, I'm not gonna have us run this just yet. And again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this, but cross tabs are not two. Okay. So for more complex statistical analysis, uh, we have a bunch of tools that come with the stats package and the stats package comes with R. So all of the things I'm talking about today are already available to you. You don't need to download any additional packages. today. So we're gonna talk about, um, these are the things that you can do with base R, chi-squared tests, p-tests, correlation and covariance, ANOVA and linear regression models, generalized linear regression models like logistic Poisson and so on, time series. And it also has a bunch of uh, statistical distributions where you can generate random numbers like random normal or random Poisson, for instance. But of course, a lot of the functionality of R comes in those packages that you can download. Okay. Um, we're just gonna go quickly over a few of these um, to give you an idea of kind of the things that you can do. So chi-square tests are used to test the association between two categorical variables. Um, if you wanna test where the proportions along one variable are, are the same across levels of the second variable, that's what a chi-square test is used for. Um, here, we're doing a chi-square test between hospital and insured. So in other words, we wanna know whether the proportion that are insured is the same across the three hospitals, all right? And here you just put the two variables that you're looking for the association among into chi-square.test. And here it returns the chi-square value, the degrees of freedom and the p-value. Um, okay. That's chi-square test. Now, um, a lot of the statistical functions that we're gonna be talking about in a moment use formulas and Formulas are generally used when you have a dependent variable and, an in, oh, and one or more independent variables. And the, right, the way you write a formula is that you put the dependent variable on the left, then you write a tilde, and then you put the independent variables on the right and you can separate them with pluses. So here, this is saying that the dependent variable is Y and the independent variable is A. We also call independent variables predictors or covariates. We also call the dependent variables outcomes. So here I'm saying that Y, the dependent variable or outcome is predicted by A and B. If you need an interaction term, you can ask R to create it for you. It'll basically underneath the hood, create a variable that's the product of the two terms that you put uh, on the, either side of this colon. So this is saying I have now have Y, the dependent variable predicted by A and B and the interaction of A and B. If you don't know what an interaction is, uh, unfortunately we don't have time to explain it today, but I, I assume many of you do know what that is. You can also do a shorthand for this A plus B plus A colon B with the star. And this star means give me both the interaction and the lower order effects. 
Okay, so these two statements, these two formulas are exactly the same. Okay. So uh, for instance, we can uh, in the, run a independent samples t-test or two sample t-tests, right? To run this, we're going to use the t.test function. On the left goes the dependent variable. So we want to know whether test one, the mean of test one, is different between the two genders, right? Dependent variable, this is the dependent variable. And then we just put that in there. Um, this is going to be very common also, where you put just the variable names, and then there's going to be an argument called data equals, where you're going to specify which data set these variables are located inside, all right? And so this says, yeah, uh, within the data set blood tests, test the a test whether the means of test one are different between the two genders. And so it, it gives me the T value, the degrees of freedom and the P value here, a confidence interval for the difference between the means and the actual means of the two groups, okay? Okay, so let's try this. Let's do a T test to determine whether mass scores are different between the genders. We're going to use the variable female for the genders, and we're going to uh, get these columns from the that underscore CSV data set. Okay, so that code is t.test. We're going to use a formula. So remember, on the left side of the formula goes the dependent variable, which is math here. On the right side goes the independent variable, which is female. And then we're almost always going to have a data argument where we specify which data set these variables are located. And, and then I run it. So again, maths predicted by female inside of this data set. And here we have the results. Does not look like the mean of math is significantly different between the two. OK. Uh, I'm not going to go over paired samples t-test, but here's the code in case you need it. It doesn't actually use a formula. It's a little different. But in case you need to do one, there's the code for you. Here I do want to go over about linear regression because a lot of you are going to be using R for regression type commands. Um, so in regression, we have a dependent variable that's predicted by one or more uh, independent variables. And to run a linear regression, we are going to use the LM function. Uh, and the coding is just like we've shown you before. You have LM inside, you have the dependent variable, tilde, and then a list of your independent variables separated by plus, and then the data set. In this case, you should always save the results to an object because there are a lot of functions that you can run on the object that will tell you more things or will produce more things. So here on out, whenever you're running regression functions, I, we highly recommend that you store them inside an object, okay? So here, for example, I'm running this and I'm storing the results of this linear regression of test one on age and gender in this object called M1. If I just then look at what's inside M1, it produces this very, very <laughs> succinct output. There's a lot more inside of M1 besides this, but this is what it'll show you by default. Um, what you'll do though, it actually, it turns out, is you're gonna be using a lot of these extractor functions on that model object we just created, M1, to get more output. Um, so for example, you can use the summary function on that model object M1, and it'll produce a regression table of the coefficients, the standard errors, the test statistics, show you that real quick. So remember M1, M1 is the fun, is the object that's created by LM. And when I run summary on it, it gives me this whole regression table right here. Right? So I have the intercept uh, and then the predictors, there are two regression coefficients and the p-values for those regression coefficients, their standard errors and so on. As little symbols for significance, uh, it also has like your R squared here uh, and your overall F test for the entire model, for example. So this is usually what you want to look at after running it. Um, so you'll run summary on that model object. But that model object can also be used inside of COEF to just get the coefficients. If you want to get the residuals from your model, you can put the model object inside of residuals. 
If you want to get predictions for your observations, you put it in my predict. If you want confidence intervals for these coefficients, you put the model object inside a confident. And this is going to be true of a lot of regression type of commands that you'll store the model object and then run some function on, the, on that model object to get further output. Okay. Okay, so let's try a linear regression real fast. We're going to perform a linear regression of the outcome read with predictors math, female, and SES using dat underscore CSV. We're going to call the model object N1 and then interpret the results. All right, and we're going to use summary on that to interpret. Okay, so we want read predicted by math, female, and SES. Okay, so remember, I'm going to save the model object as M1. Then I'm going to assign to it using the arrow. I'm going to use the LM function. Read is the outcome. And then it's going to be predicted by math and female and SES. And then the data set is dat underscore CSV. All right, that's all we have to type at this point. Um, this is wrong. OK. When I run that, everything seems fine. Now, again, this M1 actually has a lot of stuff in there. So I'm going to put it inside a summary to get my regression table. Okay. From here, I can then figure out what are my results, what are my coefficients, their standard errors, and their p values. Okay. So that's how you run a linear regression in R. All right, yeah, here's the output of coef. These are just the coefficients. Here's the confidence intervals, for example. Uh, yeah. We're not going to talk about ANOVA today. Uh, we don't have time. All the, all the slides that have a star are the ones that I'm skipping, basically. So it's here if you need it. If you need to know how to do an ANOVA in R, you can look at this slide, but we're not going to be discussing it today. There's also um, some regression diagnostics. Basically, if you put the M1 object inside of plot, you'll get several plots that are um, used to assess the assumptions of the linear regression model, such as normality of the residuals and um, that there are no observations that are overly influential, for example. Okay, but again, we're not gonna be going over, going over this. These are the plots that you'll see that um, when you put M1, that model object inside a plot, it produces these diagnostic plots. For Okay, if you need to run things like logistic regression or Poisson regression, you're going to use the GLM function instead of the LM. And the main twist here, it's still the dependent variable predicted by independent variables. Again, there's a data set, uh, but you'll need to specify the family that the outcome is presumed to belong to, right? So for instance, you can, in this case where this is a logistic regression, because we think that insured, the variable insured is binomially distributed. But uh, you know, another example is that you could have Poisson here, for example, if you need to do a Poisson regression. I know many of you may not know exactly what these terms mean, and that's okay. It's not important to understand those things here, but just know that if you need to run a logistic regression, um, this is how you do it through GLM. And you're gonna save it in a model object. And again, you can run things like summary to get a regression table. Um, these are coefficients expressed in the log odds metric. For instance, if you need odds ratios, you just need to exponentiate them yourself. So I'm using coef here to extract the coefficients and then using exp to uh, exponentiate them. Okay, and here I'm exponentiating the confidence intervals of those coefficients, for example. Okay. Okay. Um, here's just a list of other packages you might find useful to do other kinds of statistical analyses that we haven't talked today. So if you uh, need to run some mixed models, I would look into LME4 or MCMC GLMM. If you need to do survival analysis, here's survival, ordinal for ordinal, NNet for multinomial, Levon for structural equation modeling and latent variable modeling. If you have complex survey data with probability weights or sampling weights, Look into the survey package. If you need to do multiple imputation, we recommend the MICE package, but also there's other alternatives like Amelia. Bootstrapping, honestly, you can write yourself a lot of the time, but you might find the bootstrap, the boot package useful. 
And if you need to do some Bayesian modeling, um, there's three different packages that you can use. Although actually R scan is the main one and rethinking and BRMS kind of inter make it R or kind of like user-friendly versions of R scan. Okay, any questions on the stats part? The outputs can be saved as an object. If I need to go yes. back and find them, where do I find it? Would it be in that, um, what is it called, the environment where it has a list of? Yeah, you um, can see it in here, for example. Object that we can. And, yeah. Okay, and then if I, um, if I have to, um, let's say I'm ending the session. If I have to go back, how do I retrieve these results? Well, you can either, you know, write save the code and you know just rerun this code or you can do save and then you can save like m1 and then you know um m1.r data and then you can load it with load we haven't shown this yet but yeah you can save sure. objects using save and load instead okay but normally what i would do is i would just rerun um it's not too like too arduous. I would just rerun the code. Okay, so you know sometimes when you run the regression analysis, uh, I'm talking with an experience with SAS. It gives you several part of out outputs, and SAS have the option of outputting each table with a separate table name. So, for example, if you run a, um, a regression here, and uh, the example ML, would it save all the outputs in that one object, or do I have to? Uh, create a separate objects for, um, how do I say, for, uh, I can't, the top of my mind, no, the, those table names are not coming up. Like there's a part where it shows the frequency and there's a part where it shows the difference of freedom and I know one, all those stuff. So how does it work here? Yeah, um, it works differently from SAS where, yeah, you won't have those individual tables. Instead, you have this one object and you can run different functions on that object to get different okay. things out of it. Yeah. But okay. this object actually has a lot in it. It just, like if I run SCR, it has a ton in there. It's just not shown. But these functions that we run, like summary, will kind of pull out the parts of it that you need. So it's a little different from SAS in that respect. But yeah, you just need to find a function that will pull out the right information. The right information. And I would get help from which uh, function to use from that help uh, yes. window on the, okay, yes. got it. Yeah. Luckily, there is a lot of online help for R too, much more I would say for any other package. So usually if you Google things for R, they actually return results nice. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna keep going now. So we're gonna change gears, we're getting out of stats, we're gonna move now to graphics. So, you know, graphics is one of the main reasons that people love R and people use R is because it's so strong in producing and making graphics easy for you. Um, and there's two systems I'm gonna talk about today. And the first system is base R graphics. So these are the graphics that come with R um, that you don't have to download any package to use. And it has four main functions that can be used to create graphics um, for statistical graphics in particular. Plot, which is used to create scatter plots, and also lines. Uh, hist for histograms, box plot for box plots, and bar plot for bar plots. <laughs> Very obvious names for the last two. Okay, so for example, um, if I want to create a simple scatter plot of two variables, I use the plot function, and I just put the two variables inside a plot. So the first variable is along the x-axis, and the second variable will be along the y-axis. Next, uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of options for plot. If you do question mark plot, it's, it, there's a lot of things that go along with plot, but we can easily change, for instance, the titles along the axes with X lab, that'll change the X axis. Y lab changes the Y axis title and the main is used to change the overall title. Uh, of course, there's a lot of control over how the scatter plot looks. So I can change the color of the symbols if I want and the shape of the symbols. So I use the call equals argument to change the color. And I use the PCH equals argument to change the symbol. So here I've used 
steel blue as a color. Um, and then I use this symbol 17. And let me show you how I got those. So the colors, if you just type colors, colors, open close parens like this, it'll give you a list of acceptable color names. And there, you can see there are a lot, there's 657. Um, I think somewhere on the internet, there is a, there are web pages that show you what each of these are, but I, I don't have that be right now. But any one of these I could have specified after call equals. Then the other thing I wanna show you are these plotting symbols. And you can find where those are in the help file for PCH. So if I do uh, question mark PCH, not P chi square, PCH. If you scroll down here, right here, this gives you the numeric code. I know it may be a little hard for you to see on your screen, but this gives you the numeric code that uh, corresponds to each of the plotting shapes. So here I specified 17, which is this solid triangle right there. Okay. And so here's the color, here's the shape. Now I have these blue triangles. Okay, so let's practice this. Um, let's create a scatter plot of the dat CSV variables read and write. And let's change the shape of the symbols to solid squares and their color to red. Okay, so I'm gonna put read on the X axis and write on the Y axis. Plot, and inside parentheses, I want dat underscore CSV read on the x-axis, dat underscore CSV write on the y-axis. I wanted to change the color to red, so I'm going to just do call equals red. You can use whatever color you want, honestly. I'm just using red here. And then I want the symbol, which are solid squares. And so I go find here where there's a solid square, Oop, right here and it's number 15. So I say PCH equals 15. And here's my scatter plot of read versus write using red squares. Sorry, my, okay. Okay. All right, this is an example of a histogram. It's exactly what you expect. Um, it will give you an idea of the distribution of your variable by binning it and then counting how many observations fall into those bins. Usually it should be used with a continuous variable. And then box plots are another way to visualize um, distributions. But what's nice about box plots is that you can separate box plots by a variable. So here, for example, I'm saying, give me box plots of test two separately for those that are not insured and those that are insured. So you can compare distributions. Um, so for example, we can see like the median of the insured people on test two is much higher than the median of people who are not insured in test two, okay? Um, fortunately, a lot of the arguments are the same between these plotting functions. So like X lab and Y lab, we've seen before and main, these are used to label the axes. And I can also use the call argument again to change the color. So here I just changed. So, um, you know, once you learn how to do it, it's, it, you know, you, it's, it, fortunately you, you can use this, the same arguments across all of these. And then there are bar plots. Um, bar plots are often used to visualize frequencies. Um, uh, for instance, you know, if you want to count how many observations there are that belong to each group, uh, bar plots are a great, great way to visualize that. Um, so because of that, one thing that bar plot accepts is the output of table. Remember, table is used to create those frequency tables, and I can just stick table uh, inside a bar plot, and then it'll create a plot of that, okay? So for instance, here I've created a two-way table of gender and hospital. And so it, this table will count how many observations belong to each gender by hospital. And then I put the result of that inside a bar plot and I add a legend to it, all right? So this tells me these are the three hospitals and it tells me these are males and females different by color. And this tells me about how many there are of each one, okay? Very simple. 
Again, we have a lot of the same arguments that we can use again, such as color, but here I actually specify two colors, right? One for each gender. And here I also add the side equals truth to have them, uh, the bars next to each other rather than stacked on top of each other. So there are a lot of options that you can use to customize graphs in R. Obviously it would take us you know, a whole day to go over all of these options. So we don't have time. But just know that there's a lot of customizability that's possible when you graph in R. Okay, so that is base R graphics and they are totally fine and you can go very far with them. But I will say a lot of people love R specifically for ggplot2. That is a second graphical system um, that you can use in R. And basically you can pretty much do almost everything in one that you can do in the other Sometimes one of them, one, one kind of graph will be easier to do in one system than the other. I personally love ggplot2 and I find it very intuitive to use. What I think a lot of people like about ggplot2 is that the graphs that you get with just a little code tend to look better than the graphs you get with base R graphics. ggplot just has some really nice defaults that make the graphs that it produces with very little code, they just tend to look really nice. Okay, um, so if you wanna make like really beautiful publication quality graphics without learning a ton of code, I would highly recommend you learn ggplot2. Uh, we do have a workshop that teaches ggplot2 and we tend to give that workshop in the spring. So look for that workshop. Um, one thing that's really hard to do in base R are these legends. Um, sometimes legends can be very hard to create in base R graphics. And if you need to panel, like create the same graphic, but in different panels, that is much easier in ggplot2 than it is in base R. So if you know you're gonna to have to be doing lots of legends or panels, you may wanna go ahead and just jump into ggplot2. Um, it's, uh, the framework of ggplot2 is to create layered graphics. So you add on different layers, more and more layers to, until you have the graph that you want. And underneath the hood, ggplot2 uses something that's called the grammar of graphics. Um, and this was created by someone named Leland Wilkinson. And it is a framework, like I said, where you build graphics layer by layer. Instead of memorizing a whole bunch of little different options for a particular graphing function. Okay. And like I said, it usually takes a lot less work in ggplot2 to make a really nice looking graph. Okay, so if you haven't already, let's go ahead and load ggplot2 into your R session with library. So I'm going to type library and then ggplot2. All right, so go ahead and do that if you haven't already. All right, the basic syntax of a ggplot2 plot is this right here. Okay, so the function is called ggplot, not ggplot2 like the package. The package just has a two, the function does not have a two. So you're gonna type out ggplot, then the first argument is the name of the data set, then you're going to put this AES function inside of ggplot. And inside of AES, you're usually going to specify a variable that goes on the x-axis. And oftentimes, you're going to specify a variable that goes on the y-axis as well. And then after closing the ggplot function, you do a plus. And I'm sorry, this should have all appeared. The plus should appear at the end of this line, not here. That's a bad mistake. Um, but you're gonna add on another geom function. Uh, and these geoms determine what shapes are gonna be plotted. So for instance, you can have something called geom point, which will produce a scatter plot. Or you can have geom bar, which will produce a bar plot. Or you can have geom box, which produces a box plot. All right, so the different geoms produce different shapes of graphs, okay? Inside of AES, though, is where we tell ggplot what variables are tied to like the x and the y axis or are linked to color, for example, or size. All right. If you want to dive into ggplot2, uh, we recommend that you take a look at our introduction to ggplot2 seminar online. And again, we'll give it live probably in the spring. There's also a recording of it on our YouTube channel already. So you can go ahead and look at that recording as well. Okay, so um, let me give you an example. 
So uh, here, we're actually, I'm using our dat underscore CSV data set here. And here, I'm just gonna create a simple scatter plot. So remember the first, uh, you use the ggplot function. The first argument is the data set. And then you put this AES function inside of ggplot where you specify which variables go where. So here I'm saying that the math variable goes on the x-axis and the right variable goes on the y-axis. And then I want to create a scatter plot of that, right? And so here I have math and right, and you can see a scatter plot, but you can see that's all I did. And ggplot kind of has already these nice looking circles and this gray grid, which some people like, some people don't, but in some ways it kind of looks a little bit more modern than base R graphics already. But it's, uh, what the, the, the great thing about ggplot is that you can so easily add these layers. And all you do is you use the plus sign and you can keep adding more and more layers. So here with just one extra line, I've added this best fit line, basically the regression line of write on read, I'm sorry, write on math. So this is uh, like the regression of uh, the regression line for write predicted by math with a confidence interval. And I did that by adding a geom smooth layer. All right, so geom smooth is what produces this kind of curve or line that fits the data. Okay, and here it's, I'm just saying, use a linear regression to create this line. Okay, but I can add even more, right? So here, what I'm now doing is I can assign variables in that CSV to aspects of the graph. I'm saying now create the graph, but color it by female. And what's cool about ggplot is it knows to apply coloring by female to both the scatter plot and to the smooth lines here. So you can see that now I have dots that are colored by gender and I have these smooth lines that are colored by gender as well. And so again, and also just, it looks nice too, right? It has a very nice modern look about it. So this again is kind of the reason why people love ggplot is that it makes it so easy to create these kind of fancy looking graphs with just a little bit of code. And once you learn the framework, it'll become very intuitive, okay? Now, this is where ggplot really gets good. It's with paneling. Um, and this is what I mean by paneling, where you wanna split the graph into multiple panels and ggplot makes it really easy with these facet functions. There's two of them. I'm using one called facet wrap here. All I do is I add another layer here I'm using this facet wrap function, and this says split the graph into three graphs by the variable prog. And so th this is a program variable. So these are the students that are in the academic program. These are the students that are in the general program, and these are the students in the vocational program. And for instance, here you can look whether the relationship between math and write is the same across all of these. And yeah, it looks like maybe the relationship between math and write is a little different in the general students from how it is in the academic and vocational students, right? So this kind of graph is much harder to do in base R, but really easy to do in ggplot. And auto, again, it looks pretty good already, right? And all it took with these four lines of code. And then finally, um, ggplot comes with a lot of these, what they're called complete theme functions that will change the overall appearance of the plot. And I just wanna show you, yeah, it has these, Again, just add a single layer and you can kind of really change the look of the plot. So here we got rid of the gray grid behind, right? This is actually classic. This is supposedly mimicking the look of base art graphics here. And here below, I use a dark theme instead on kind of a dark gray background and make these headers black. And again, very easy to do just with adding this right here. Okay, so I just wanna show you here that ggplot makes it really easy to create these complex looking graphics with just a little bit of coding. And honestly, it's not that hard to learn once you, once you learn how to do a, you know, one kind of graph, it's, you're learning the grammar, then that grammar applies to all graphs. Whereas in base R, you kind of have to remember a lot of specific options for functions. And actually this is even more true in uh, other softwares like Stata or SAS or SPSS. Each, a lot of their graphing functions has very specific options. Whereas in ggplot too, it's more like the same grammar applies across all different kinds of graphs. So that's one nice thing about ggplot. 
Okay, we're gonna practice making one ggplot really fast. What we wanna do is we wanna create a scatter plot of read again on the x-axis and write on the y-axis. And I want to color the dots by SES. So we're gonna start with that first, okay? So um, you always start with a ggplot function. Remember not, it's ggplot, not ggplot2 for the function name. Then the first argument is the name of the data set always. So I can do that underscore CSV, comma. Then you put an AES function inside of ggplot like that. AES and then open and close parens. Like and then here I'll specify which variable goes on the x-axis. I'll put read on the x-axis and I'll put write on the y. Okay. If I just do this, it'll just give me axes. So nothing happens yet. I need to add the scatter plot. Wait, is that what I asked for? Sorry. Scatter plot. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to add the scatter plot, right? But then I also said color the dots by SES, right? And when I assign variables to graphical aspects, I put that inside of AES. So I'm going to say color equals SES. And I'm gonna rerun this and now you'll see it's going to give me three colors of uh, dots by SES. Okay. Now the last thing I wanted you to do is to add a geom smooth, right? So that'll add um, smooth lines. So just real simple, just add geom smooth like this, open and close parens, nothing else. That's all for now we need. And let's run this all. Remember, I put the plus at the end if I need to continue the command on the next line. Okay, and here you can see it produced three different lines, right? Because this color applies to all of these geons, right? And so it knows to set, give me separate scatter plots and separate smooth lines by SES. And that's what makes ggplot so powerful. This, honestly, this graph would take a lot more coding and other software packages, not just these, you know, three, two or three lines that I have. Okay, so this will give you some idea of the power of ggplot2. Okay, any questions about graphing at all? I know, I mean, we could spend days going over graphing, but if you have any questions now, now's a good time. Okay, wait, is there a question? Yes, I mean, you can certainly plot longitudinal data. You just, in general, have to get your data set up in the right way, um, but yeah, you can certainly plot longitudinal data. Um, I mean, you can plot you know, almost any kind of data with either system. It might be easier or harder in one of the two systems, but yeah, certainly. You know, you could put, for instance, time on the x-axis, and if you have like multiple subjects, you can facet by the different subjects, and you'll get separate panels by subject, for example. Okay. And okay. Can you show how to just um, not subset the regression line by the SES? Does does ggplot not do that as well? So you can still get the 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 the, the dot functions and filter them, but you just want one regression line? Or is it always just automatically going to give you the two? You can. So if I wanted just one regression line, I, then I, I can turn off the color specification specifically in Geom Smooth like this. Uh, thank you. OK. If you want to learn stuff like that, kind of, uh, you know, look into our ggplot2 seminar. Yeah. There are ways to override these specifications in the individual geons. Okay. All right, cool though. Um, all right, that is the end of our graphic section. We're now getting into our last section, which is going to be about our markdown during your work. And ggplot, as I said, is one of the, you know, one of my favorite reasons for using R. The other one is R markdown, which I'm going to go over now. And R Markdown is um, used to create reproducible documents that are going to weave together some text and R code and the output of that R code all together into one nice document. 
And one of the R Markdown's greatest strengths is the variety of output documents that it can create, such as HTML web pages, LaTeX documents, Word documents, HTML slideshow, PowerPoint slideshows. There are a lot of now output documents that um, R Markdown can output to. And these documents are dynamically generated, meaning that we can change a little bit of code and then recreate the document and it'll just instantly be recreated with the new code and the new output. We don't have to do any kind of reformatting usually. It's just instantly updated. And then, you know, this is a great way to share your results with your colleagues or your principal investigator or whoever else you want to share it with. Um, it's a very nice document that they can look at. For example, this very slideshow you are looking at right now was made in R Markdown. And the entire thing was written in R Markdown. Um, so you can see how flexible these documents are and how much detail you can put into them just by looking at this slideshow. So the way it works <clears throat> is that when R Markdown encounters a code block in a file, it embeds that code block into the document and the output of that document, oh, and the output of that code is also embedded in the document. So in the R Markdown file that I used to create this entire slideshow, I put in this code for this bar plot. And then when R Markdown sees this code, this R code, it puts the R code into the document, although I can control that. And it puts the output of the, um, of the R code into the document as well. All right, so let's get some experience with this. Again, we have a, another whole workshop to teach you R Markdown, which we tend to give in the fall, uh, in the winter. So sometime around like February or March. Uh, we will we often give it, but it's also, I believe, on our YouTube channel as well. So you can um, find the R Markdown recording on the YouTube. Um, okay, let's try the R Markdown ourselves. So what I want you to do is I want you, to, you, you do need R Markdown installed. I want you to go and open a new R Markdown file. So go to File, New File, R Markdown, right here and then click on it. When you click on it, this window will open up. So let me show that to you again in case anybody missed it. File, new file on Markdown. And then this will come up, okay? Uh, leave it here on document and then put whatever title you want. You can do it. Uh, I'm gonna just title it practice. You can put your name in there if you want, okay? Then when you've entered those fields, hit okay, HTML, Go, go ahead and keep it on the HTML, okay? It will then open this document for you, All right? Now, these R Markdown files typically use the extension .rmd, uh, and the R Markdown file consists of three elements that you really need to learn about. First element is the YAML header, and this is the header right here. And this is where you tell, for instance, what kind of output you want it to make, what kind of document. So here I'm saying create an HTML document, but I could also put Word document here, for example, or I could put late, a PDF document for a LaTeX file if I wanted. This is where I control kind of the overall output, the overall look of the document. Um, so that's one, one aspect of our Markdown files that you should learn. Uh, the second, sorry, it keeps scrolling. The second aspect is the markdown tags. So these tags, uh, like this hashtag hashtag or these stars, they're used to format the text in a specific way. So you'll see like these two hashtags and um, our studio has kind of highlighted it in blue for you. This will actually turn this into a header and this will bold this text knit, okay? so. Those are what we call markdown tags, and those are just little symbols we use to format text in a very specific way, okay? Then the third aspect you wanna learn about are the R code chunks, all right? And those are the little gray areas that are inside these little kind of back tick marks here. So this is an R code chunk. This is an R code chunk right here. 
And you can see how it's been delimited by these little three backtick symbols and this part right there. This is where you put R code inside of these chunks. And then when the, you create the document, it will put the output of this R code directly into the document. Okay. So what I want you to try now is I want you to create a document with the knit button. Okay. So when you're finished with your R markdown file and you like how it looks, you knit it. And that's what renders um, the, all of that file into your output document. Okay. So go ahead and click on knit right here. So you see where it says knit with a little ball of yarn and the knitting needles, go ahead and click knit. You're going to have to give it a name. Um, I'm just going to call it practice again, and then give it the extension, extension RMD for our markdown file. Okay. The reason why um, I say to give it dot RMD is because our studio will recognize RMD as an R markdown file, and it'll do this nice syntax highlighting. It'll highlight these code chunks for you. So all of this, you know, coloring is because our markdown recon, sorry, our studio recognizes this as an R markdown. So when I hit the knit, there was another window that come up, came up, and this is my, uh, this is a preview basically of the file that's created from this. But if I um, see, there is an actual file that's also created. So if I go look into my documents, this right here is the HTML. So this is an HTML document. Um, this is the actual file that's been created. So HTML is basically like a web page. And this is the file that, for instance, you could give to one of your colleagues to look at, right? And you can see, for instance, that wherever there's code, it repeats the code, but then it also embeds the output. So one of those codes was to create a plot, right? This one right here. And that plot also gets directly embedded into this file, okay? All right, so let's play around a little bit with this R markdown file. Oops, sorry. With this R markdown file. So you can see some of how we use it. The markdown, remember, are those tags that we use to format the text to look a certain way. Um, HTML is actually its own set of tags. If you've ever looked like at a web page before, um, like all of this link, li, all of this, all of these are HTML tags, like this ul, li, this says create like a bulleted list, for example. <clears throat> but these are actually HTML tags. So HTML is another like kind of markup language that formats text. Markdown is kind of like HTML lite. It is a shorthand version for HTML tags. So for instance, if you want to create italics in HTML, you enclose text in these EM tags. Like this is the opening, then you put like text inside, and then you close it with this slash EM tag. That's how you do it in regular HTML. But in Markdown, you just put stars on each side. So that's what I mean by it. it's a shorthand for HTML. So Again, there's many more tags than I've listed here. We don't have any time to go over a lot of them. But for instance, if I have just one star, it'll italicize it. If I have two stars around it, it'll create a bold. And if I put um, a pound sign uh, or hashtag, it'll create a header. And I can put multiple hashtags to create different levels of header. So the biggest header is the one that has just one hashtag. And I can go, I believe, up to six. And that'll be the smallest header, okay? Um, yes, be careful about your spacing here. You do want a space between the hashtag and the header, but you don't want spaces between like these texts and these star symbols, for example. Okay, so here, let's try to identify which text in the RMD file has been formatted with markdown tags. And now let's try changing the bolded words to italics. Okay. So, Remember the tags, I kind of already went over this. We know that these are header tags. These are bold tags, right? And so when I look in the output, our markdown is a header, right? This is a header. So that's why it's big like this. 
Similarly, including plots is a header. Knit has these bold tags, and you can see that knit is bolded there, right there. So you can, you know, emphasize text in your document using these tags. Um, Let's, I said, let's change the bolding on knit to italics, right? So two stars on each side is bold. One star on each side is italics. So all I do is re-knit and instantly it's changed to italics, right? And so this is part of the dynamic aspect of our markdown is that, yeah, you can very quickly reformat text with just by changing the tags. But what's really useful, of course, is changing the data set, which we'll get to in a minute. Let's also just try out a header. So I want you to add a level four header, meaning add four hashtags and then write out the header, header four. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I'm just gonna put it at the bottom. I'm just gonna type out four hashtags and then I'm gonna type header four. And I do need a space here, um, but our markdown recognize these, our markdown tags and it will highlight it in blue for you. And so when I re-knit this, kind of at the bottom, I apologize. But you can see that here's the header four, and you can see it's considerably smaller than these level two headers right here. Okay, So that's uh, one way you can create sections in your document. OK, so that's the markdown tags. Now let me talk about the R code chunks. So, in these markdown files, these R codes, uh, the code for that you want to run is placed in these code chunks. And then our markdown is going to put the output of that code chunk inside of the document, right? In addition with the R code itself. Um, there are a lot of options, which I'm not going to go over today at all, to control the appearance of both the code and the output. Um, but again, we don't have time to go over those today. I just want to show you how some of the things you can do with these code chunks. Again, these code chunks are delimited by these little back ticks. The first, the first part of it also has this um, curly brace R, and then you can put a chunk label and options in there if you want, uh, and then you close it with these three back ticks. Now you can type those if you like, but honestly, it's kind of cumbersome. So it's good for you to learn the shortcuts, to add a chunk. So you can use Control Alt I um, to add a code chunk. It'll be Command Option I on a Mac. Or you can use the green insert code button in R Studio. Okay. So that button is, sorry, I, is right here, this button. So you go to insert and then here R, it'll insert a code chunk for you. So what I want you to do is I want you to follow these instructions right here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add an R code chunk using either the shortcut control alt I or the code button. Try not to type them. It's, it, it's too much trouble typing and it's prone to error. So instead use one of these methods. Then we're gonna load a data set that's called trees that comes with R. And then we're gonna calculate the correlation among the three variables in trees. Okay, let's try this. And then we're gonna knit it, all right? But I'll, I'll do it slowly with you. So inside of your RMD file, I want you to add a code chunk first. Okay, so if you're on a PC, it's gonna be Control-Alt-I, or if you're on a Mac, it's gonna be Command-Option-I, or you can also do it with this. You can hit this button and then click R, add it that way. And all you need, this is the very basic specification for an R code chunk, remember as those opening and closing tags, okay? Then inside this code chunk, I want you to load the data set oops, called trees by typing data and then put trees inside quotes like this. Okay. And then we're gonna just do a correlation among the three variables in trees like that. So I just put the trees, this loads it into R and then this gives me the correlation among the three variables. So I'm gonna knit that and you'll see now it has added the code and the output of the code, which is that correlation matrix of the three variables that are inside the street, right? That's so nice, right? What you'll, you know, when you do a lot of data analysis, one of the most annoying things is when you have to redo an analysis because something has changed 
and you have all these nice tables that you've made and you have to remake them. And it can take a lot of time to remake those, but our markdown can make that really easy for you. So what I want you to do is I want you to change the data set by we're gonna subset to only those observations where height is greater than 80. And I want you to do that by actually using the subset command. The best way is really just to copy this right here. So just copy this command, trees, uh, assigned to it, we're gonna subset trees to only those observations where the height is greater than 80. This is similar to filter that we used before, but without going into too much detail, filter is not available in this unless we library it inside of this R markdown file, and I'm not gonna do that for now. So all I want you to do is after the data line, just add this line that says trees, assigned to it, subset trees, based on height, only those trees above 80. And what I'm trying to show you here is that even if you change the data set like I'm doing here, right, this will reduce trees. I don't, that's all I have to do, right? All I have to do is change the data set and then hit net and then everything subsequent, like this correlation matrix has now changed, right? I don't have to redo it, recopy and paste it somewhere. It's right here, automatically changed, all right? And so that's the great thing about our markdown is that you can, you know, easily remake the output document with a different data set just by changing the code and re -knitting. And then everything will be redone for you. Really, really nice. Okay. Finally, um, I want to do some adjustments to the YAML header just so you can see the flexibility in the output documents that it can make. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about the language that's used, but there, it's another language that's called YAML that's used up here. And it interfaces with this program that's called Pandoc that's installed with R Markdown. And this Pandoc program is what can translate between the many different output documents. Um, so as I mentioned before, the default is the HTML document, which is a web page. But we can also make HTML slideshows, LaTeX PDF documents, Word documents, and PowerPoint presentations, and even books. All right. And the way we change this is with that output argument in the YAML header. Okay. So what I want you to do is scroll up here and just change the word HTML to Word and then renet. And what you'll find here is now it's produced a Word file with the same stuff, the same code, the same correlation matrix that we have, but in, in a different output format, right? Uh, but I can also do different things, right? I can also do a slideshow. So if I do slidey presentation, for instance, Slidey presentation is what uh, I use to create the slideshow that you're looking at for this workshop. And this creates a slideshow out of it, right? With the exact same things that we've done before. Okay. Uh, and again, you can practice all of these or change these on your own, but there are many different output document types. Uh, and so again, our markdown is one of the really, really great things about using R is because you can really create these very nice documents to share all of your data analysis with your colleagues. Very easy way to create documents as well. Are there any questions about R Markdown? Okay, then we're just gonna wrap up. Um, I just have some links for you here. Uh, we have some workshops in R, other workshops to extend beyond this. So this was the introductory workshop. Um, in a couple of weeks, actually, we're going to be giving this workshop, Introduction to Regression in R. So Siavash, the one who has been answering your all of your questions in chat, thank you, Siavash, uh, will be delivering that workshop. I'll be there answering questions in chat then. Um, and then we have some of these R, um, we do tend to give in the spring and the winter. But these are also, I believe these two, R Markdown Basics and ggplot are also now on our YouTube. Um, we can give you the link to our YouTube channel in the chat as well. We also have one on survival analysis, uh, on SEM, and on R data management. 
Um, so check those out if you're interested. Um, our website has a lot of now R related stuff on it. We've been trying to grow the R parts of our website. Um, so you'll find a lot of helpful pages on our website. So for instance, um, for instance, if you go to software here, R, you'll find um, some like our fact pages, but for example, these are our data analysis pages where this is the column for R, where we'll, for example, just give you a quick example of how to run a logistic regression in R. We'll give you a data set, and then we'll give you some code on how to run it, uh, and then thinking about the assumptions of the model as well. Um, so we have a, you know, several pages on different kinds of analyses in R. That's our website. Stack Overflow. So one of the nice things about, like I said about R, especially compared to other packages, is that there's a lot of people that use R. So there are a lot of questions that people ask that are answered about R on the web. Um, so, you know, if you try to Google something, you're probably more likely to find the answer in R than if you were, for instance, in SPSS. Uh, this book, R for Data Science, is a really great online free book. It's written by um, Hadley Wickham and Garrett Rollmund, who are uh, the people who also created R Studio. And it's just uh, something that you can follow along yourself and learn R in a kind of a data science-y way. Um, and it's very easy to follow and gives you a really nice introduction to a lot of the tools that the R Studio people make, including this Tidyverse, which is a whole suite of packages um, that try to make R more modern and uh, ready to do data science. So uh, that's another great resource you can look at yourself. Um, and <clears throat> as I said, the R community really believes in keeping things free. So there is a large array of books that you can look at that are free. Um, so here are some free online R books that you can look at. And as well, there are other books that are not necessarily free. And here's another list of books that you can read about R, some of which will not be free. And that's all I have for today.